The Mist of Avalon by Morgan Zimmer Bradley. Background information. Morgan Le Fay. The character Morgan in Bradley's novel, The Mist of Avalon, is based on Morgan Le Fay, one of the most mysterious figures in Arthurian legends. Her name comes from the Irish word meaning Morrigan, which means great queen. The French words Le Fay, which means the fairy, she probably originated in several myths about pagan goddesses. Some legends portray Morgan as a benevolent healer, but others portray her as a sorceress who plots against King Arthur and his wife. In the tradition that Bradley follows, she is Arthur's half-sister. Her mother, Igraine, married Arthur's father, Uther Pendragon, after the death of her first husband, husband Gorlois. Focusing your reading. When a character who participates in a story also narrates the action, the writer is using first-person point of view. The events in the excerpts are told by the character, character Morgan. Here's an example. I think my first real memory is of my mother's wedding to Uther Pendragon. I remember my father only a little. The first person narrator is able to give the reader an eyewitness account of the events in the story. As you read this selection, notice how Morgan expresses her feelings about each of the characters. Now to wrap up our background information and in analyzing characters, Bradley's modern retelling of the Arthurian legend involves revision of traditional versions of the story, presenting views of Arthurian characters that are quite different from those in previous versions. As you read, be aware of what you learn about each character, including the narrator. Remember that since Morgan narrates this election, all of our information is colored by her judgment. The Myths of Avalon by Marion Zimmer Bradley Morgan speaks, I think that my first real memory is of my mother's wedding to Uther Pendragon. I remember my father only a little. When I was unhappy as a little girl, I seemed to remember him. A heavy-set man with a dark beard and dark hair. I remember playing with a chain he wrote about his, about his neck. I remember that as a little maiden when I was unhappy, when I was chidden by my mother or our teachers, or when Uther rarely noticed me to disapprove of me, I used to comfort myself by thinking that if my own father were alive, he would have been fond of me and taken me on his knee and brought me pretty things. Now that I am older, and know what manner of man he was, I think it more likely he would have put me into a nunnery as soon as I had a brother, and never thought more about me. Not that Uther was ever unkind to me, it was simply that he had no particular interest in a girl child. My mother was always at the center of his heart, and he at hers, and so I resented that, that I had lost my mother to his great, fair-haired, boorish man. When Uther was away in battle, and there was a battle a good deal of the time when I was a maiden, my mother Igraine cherished me and petted me and thought me to spin with her own hands and to weave in colors. But when Uther's men were sighted, then I went back into my rooms and was forgotten until he went away again. It is any wonder I hated him and resented with all my heart the sight of the dragon banner on any horseman approaching to Digo. And when my brother was born, it was worse, for there was this crying thing, all pink and white, at my mother's breast, and it was worse she expected me to care for him as much as she did. This is your little brother, she said. Take good care of him, Morgan, and love him. Love him? I hated him with all my heart. For now, when I came near her, she would pull away and tell me that I was a big girl, too big to be sitting in her lap, too big to bring my ribbons for her tying, too big to come and lay my head on her knees for comfort. I would have pinched him, except that she would have hated me for it. I sometimes thought she hated me anyhow, and Uther made, me, Uther made much of, of my brother, but I think he always hoped for another son. I was never told, but somehow I knew. Maybe I heard the woman talking. Maybe I was gifted even with more of the sight than I realized. That he had first slain with my mother when she was still wedded to Gorlos. And there were still those who believed that this son was not Uther's, but the son of the Duke of Cornwall. 
How they could believe that, I could not then understand. For Glorlo said, was dark a Quinlan, and my brother was like Uther, fair-haired with gray eyes. Even during my lifetime of my brother, who was crowned king as Arthur, I heard all kinds of tales about how he came by his name. Even the tale that it was from Arthur, Uther, Uther's bear. But it was not so. When he was a babe, he was called Gwendian. Bright one, because of his shining hair, the, the same name his son bore later. But that's another story. The facts are simple. When Gwyndian was six years old, he was sent to be forced by Ectorius, one of Uther's vessels in the north country near Ebrocum. And Uther would have it that my brother should be baptized as a Christian. And so he was given the name Arthur. But from his birth until he was six years old, he was forever at my heels. As soon as he was weaned, my mother, Igrain, handed him over to me and said, This is your little brother, and you must love him and care for him. And I would have killed the crying thing and thrown him over the cliffs and run after my mother, begging that, that she should be all mine again, except my mother cared what happened to him. Once, when Uther came, as she decked herself in her best gown, as she always did, with her amber and moonstone necklaces, and looked down on me with careless kiss for me and one for my little brother, ready to run down Uther, I looked at her glowing cheeks, heightened with color, her breathing quickened with delight that her man had come, and, sh and hated both Uther and my brother. And while I stood weeping at the top of the stairs, waiting for our nurse to come and take us away, he began to toddle down after her, crying, Mother, mother! He could hardly talk then, and fell and cut his chin on the stair. I streamed for my mother, but she was on her way to the king, and she called back angrily, Morgan, I told you, look after the baby, and hurried on. I picked him up bawling and wiped his chin with my veil. He had cut his lip on his tooth. I think he had only eight or ten then, and he kept wailing and calling out for my mother. But when she did not come, I sat down on the step with him in my lap, and he put his little arms around my neck and buried his face into my tunic, and after time he sobbed himself to sleep there. He was heavy on my lap. His hair felt soft and damp. He was damp elsewhere, too, but I found I did not mind much, and in the way he clung to me I realized that in his sleep he had forgotten he was not in my mother's arms. I thought, Igrain has forgotten both of us, abandon him as she abandoned me. Now I must be his mother, I suppose. And so I shook him a little, and when he woke, he put up his little arms around my neck to be carried, and I slung him across my hip as I had seen my nurse do. Don't cry, I said. I'll take you to nurse. Mother, he whimpered. Mother's gone. She's with the king, I said. But I'll take you to mother, brother. And when his chubby hand in mine, I knew what Igraine meant. I was too big a girl to cry or whimper for my mother, because I had a little one to look after now. I think I was all of seven years old. 